Welcome back to the worst fighting game, my never-ending quest to crown the king of the crap when it comes to the luminous genre known far and wide as the Button Basher. Thanks for that moniker, United Kingdom. What? We don't call them Button Bashers? They're just fighting games, mate! <laughs> anyway, today's match was nominated by Dan down at the Flophouse VIP Patreon, who has enthusiastically pushed the late 80s home computer classic, Human Killing Machine, squarely into the path of my mighty fists. Now, I need to give this the gravitas it deserves. Human Killing Machine, or HKM if you're cool and want to save time, has often been cited as one of the worst fighting games of all time. Just straight up and has been a pretty regular request ever since I've started this pointless meandering journey. But aside from just being a reviled PC disaster, what's far more interesting is the game's dark, seedy, slimy origins. So without further hot dogging and grandstanding, it's time to get Human Killing Machine in the ring. It all starts with Teartex, a UK studio who in the late 80s ported notable arcade smash hits to home computers with uh, varying levels of success. And of course, when I say varying levels, I mean quite the opposite, they were all bad. The reports of 720 and Rolling Thunder for the Spectrum, Amiga, and Commodore 64 are very good examples of said badness, but tier techs were not the only ones that valued coming in under budget and under schedule. Enter US Gold. While the quality of the ports they commissioned did actually vary in quality, they were not adverse to spending the least amount of time and effort to get arcade ports out the door. This cannot be better exemplified than the home computer conversions of Capcom's original Street Fighter. The late 80s was a wild time where certain companies would just allow other shittier companies to port and distribute their titles, and Capcom's deal with US Gold was uh, one such a deal. Despite their name, Capsule Computers, they had zero experience navigating the huge amount of PC platforms that were on the market, and thus entrusted US Gold to convert their arcade fighter for them. It uh, went about as well as you can expect. What's wrong with your face? Well, none of the ports are, say, you know, good, which should be expected since the original Street Fighter can charitably be described as an unplayable mess, Tier Texas versions were especially horrid, as they were all incredibly choppy and slow and had zero special moves, no matter what machine they were designed for. And despite a lot of scathing reviews, Street Fighter was a big hit for US Gold, even Tier Texas ports, and thus they slid into Capcom's DMs, or their 80s equivalent, and started begging them to quickly make an arcade follow-up that they could then convert terribly. Capcom's original Street Fighter team, however, was gutted when SNK came ahead hunting, plucking key members away from Capcom and setting them to work on a rival fighting game franchise, which will remain mysterious. It's Fatal Fury. It's, it's Fatal Fury. Go check out the retrospective. It's really good. So, obviously, Capcom's intention to move forward with Street Fighter was put on the back burner, but US Gold were having none of it, and in a bid to convince them, concocted their own insane plan. They would have Teartex take the code and knowledge they used to port Street Fighter to make their own game, cleverly named Street Fighter 2, and then pitch that to Capcom as the official sequel. While no screens or footage of this version survives, it's safe to assume it was a massive load of bollocks. Capcom then politely said, yeah, no thanks, and went about their business. I think, in hindsight, taking their time and doing their own thing was probably the better choice, don't you? As an aside, US Gold's offer slash scam actually did work, just with another franchise. For those who might have forgotten, which is probably most of you, allow me to present Strider 2 Journey Into Darkness, licensed by US Gold, developed by Teartex, and the worst Strider game ever made. Now, just imagine if the threads of fate were weaved slightly differently. If Capcom had okayed US Gold's original plan, well, it would have changed the landscape of fighting games as we know it. Thankfully, we're in the better timeline. US Gold, however, were not to be denied. Street Fighter had been a big money spinner for them, so they were going to make a sequel, with or without Capcom's consent. Well, not, not actually without their consent. They, they couldn't use the Street Fighter name. This is Human Killing Machine. 
what Tier Text basically did here is copy everything Capcom did, a single martial artist taking on two enemies per country, battling all the way up to a final boss. The marketing, however, wouldn't really lead you to assume that. Just take a look at this. We're told that I guess Arnold Schwarzenegger here is quite mean, and he is born of snakes, apparently. Unfortunately, he's not in the game at all. But who is? A Korean martial artist by the name of Kwon. This is a bizarre switcheroo to be sure, but everything about Human Killing Machine is bizarre. So while they couldn't use the Street Fighter name directly, US Gold tried their best to steer the conversation that way. They would constantly say in interviews with PC magazines of the day that Human Killing Machine was the follow-up to Street Fighter and made that the center of HKM's marketing campaign. It's due to that for decades. It's been called the unofficial sequel to Street Fighter 1. A statement that truly embraces all the dubious honor that it carries. And that's how we ended up here today. And I, I've been delaying this long enough. I'm, I'm just gonna have to get in there and get my hands dirty with this human killing machine. So, spoilers, many games released on many early computer formats weren't exactly bleeding edge tech. Plenty of them suffered from slowdown, poor animation, lack of color, or issues with proper scrolling. It, it was just a limitation of the age. The trick was to find those companies that could work within those hardware limits and still make decent looking games that were also quite playable. Tiertex was not one of those companies. I'm playing the Amiga version of HKM, and don't be shocked when I tell you it's the best looking version of the bunch. The DOS port has eye melting colors, and the Commodore version looks like a Commodore game, so the Amiga is the default champion. Alright, first impressions. Uh, you know, you, while the game's background graphics are pretty grainy with a very limited palette and the overall presentation is not great, it, it's honestly a bit better than I was expecting. It's when you start to move that... Oh, oh yeah, that's the stuff! As you navigate around the arena, you get the distinct feeling that something's off but might not know immediately what. Well, this would be the lack of any sort of scrolling, a feature that Tiertex could never really seem to master. Scrolling backgrounds were in the arcade Street Fighter and were in the Amiga port of Street Fighter, but are gone here for reasons I can assure you I don't know. While it seems like a small thing at first, it really makes the game feel like way less of a game when there's no scrolling, something that typifies the 2D fighter. It's almost as if you're just making a sprite move around in front of a picture or a drawing rather than a cohesive video game. I do have to say though that this technical limitation or artistic choice, whatever you want to call it, is so bold and baffling to me it's actually kind of fascinating. Even more fascinating is the fact that they went with the whole tin tin face structure for the roster. Ah, yes, the roster. We have the legendary Quan, of course, our only playable character. What is he? He's strong. And, and that's it. Moving on, we have Igor. He's from Russia. Can you tell? And then there's... The <laughs> then there's Igor's dog, Shepsky. What the dog doing? He's a fucking dog, and, and you have to beat him to advance in this official worldwide tournament. I, what is the reason behind this? Check in your rule book, but you won't find anything in there that says a dog can't play. He's right! Oh, okay, well, you got me there. Igor and Shevsky were apparently the best that Mother Russia could provide, so let's move on to the Netherlands and its exotic nightclub scene. Here we find Maria and Helga. Oof! Next is Spain, where we, well, in other versions of the game, there's a Spain stage for some reason. I didn't get it. We're still in the Netherlands, but here's Miguel, Spanish matador extraordinaire. Of course, the next logical opponent is his pet bull, Brutus. Look, while this makes no sense, throwing random animals in there is some buck wild shit. And if I'm honest with myself, I kind of love it. I get a big bang of violence fight off all this animal inclusivity. Now I think we're moving on to Germany now and that's mainly due to the appearance of Hans and Franz who I can only assume are here to pop 
Yo! So the Amiga version is getting rougher and rougher, as you can see. Hans's sprite is either corrupted or he has some type of stand. Anyway, whenever you knock this dickhead down, an explosion of nonsensical sprite gore coats the ground. I'm dead! Amazing! Franz is an even bigger problem, as he's a bartender with a very loose grip on his bottles. One of the only characters, I think, that have a projectile. Because it's the late 80s, the next and final country we visit is a war-torn Kuwait. Tank and all. Sagan is our first opponent, and he looks like he stepped out of late 80s WWE. WWF. We then square off against the game's final boss, the intimidating Merkeva. Intimidating why? Because he's a giant homunculus composed of other sprites. This is another bug exclusive to the Amiga version. Merkeva's sprite just doesn't display correctly due to his mammoth girthy size. He's supposed to look like… exactly like you'd think he'd look. Once you beat him, there's no endings, no story, no nothing. I, I mean, I'm assuming so, as I can't even find the instruction manual online, but I don't even think I want to know these characters' backstories. Regardless, the actual game lacks any sort of narrative, which makes sense given the time, as games rarely did, and fighting games even less, so I can't be too harsh here. The same cannot be said about the music. Just one track that plays during every fight constantly, and by constantly, I mean all the fucking time. Now, here's the thing. This battle theme of HKM isn't all that bad. I, I've heard worse, but with the way this game is designed, you hear it way more than you should. What you hear way less of is sound effects, in that there's no sound effects at all. Not even a bleep and nary a boop. Initially, you might be like, oh, that's super lame slash lazy, but considering the sound design in other tier text games, I think we were all spared, honestly. <laughs> so, in terms of the game's overall visual look, backgrounds, and characters, it's not great at, at all, but considering the limitations of the hardware, the year it came out, and its origins, it's hard to get super mad at Human Killing Machine's presentation. Let's save getting super mad for the- HKM's modes are, well, I shouldn't say modes at all, it's more like mode. Yeah, there's only one. It is 1988, there's not going to be online training or netherrealm story shit here, so I can't in good conscience dock points for that. But I can dock points for there being no two-player mode at all. I mean, shit, Street Fighter 1 had it, it was extremely limited, but it was there. I guess Tier Techs didn't really think it was a feature anybody wanted, considering they axed it in their Street Fighter 1 port. In fact, I don't, e I don't even think Ken is even in the Tier Techs version. Is he? I don't care. So yeah, there's no two-player option, no double of Quan, hmm, Quang maybe, and of course, none of the bosses can be selected either. But if this was meant as a sequel, you'd think they would have added things into Human Killing Machine. I, I don't know, features, improvements to the gameplay. Well, well, they did add something, but it was not an improvement. Quan is strong, is not just some type of weird flex regarding his martial arts prowess, but rather it's the current status of his abilities. This is tied to the confusing verbiage written below. Quan needs five knockdowns. Opponent needs three knockdowns. Well, you might think at first that you need to knock down your foe five times to progress. It's actually the opposite. When you start, you have to make Ivan eat shit three times. If, however, you lose this match and concern he can one-shot you, that's entirely possible. Then the game will get harder. Quan's status changes upon any rematches. Uh, he gets tired, I guess, requiring him to now knock down Ivan five times while Quan can lose in three. Restarting the match isn't enough. It also needs to punish you. It's, it's unfathomable. What's more, and maybe even worse, is the game's last little quirk. 
in their desire to innovate, Tier Text decided that during matches, both players will constantly regain their health, but it's just slightly skewed. While your health replenishes at a pace that could best be described as glacial, the computer regains at the rate of every attack's worth of damage every second. If you are not constantly pounding buttons, landing hits, and sweating all over your controller, they will be at full health by the time I finish this sentence. This, this has to be one of the most insane things I've ever seen in a fighter. I mean, it's not like this was meant to suck quarters from idiot kids at an arcade. This was a dedicated home release. It's almost as if Tiertex had no idea what they were doing. Aside from that, honestly, there's not much else to say about the core mechanics. It's so jerky and slow that it's hilarious, the only strategy is to constantly attack, and there's zero special moves. Quan can sort of perform a Tatsumaki, but it's safer just to assume it's poor animation. <laughs> Now, if you've been paying attention, you'll have noticed that in most of this footage, I'm not taking any damage, and this is due to this emulated Amiga port having the option to turn on infinite health, because otherwise... Yeah... Without this though, Human Killing Machine is nigh unplayable, and since it lacks a 2P option, you can't even have the dumb fun you could in Ryu vs Ken matches in the original SF. All Tier Techs had to do was make the bosses playable so you could then have much of the same dumb fun, but they were laser focused on doing just a basic one to one copy and clearly had no ambitions to do more than that. Imagine if they had though, they would have been one of, if not the first traditional 2D fighting game to have offered a full robust roster. Ah, the path not taken. It's goddamn awful. In conclusion, Human Killing Machine very much lives up to its mystique. An unofficial sequel to Street Fighter for home computers is exactly as bad as you'd think it is. But it's still not as bad as I thought it was going to be. There is a perverse type of joy to be had in this. The random animals, the terrible graphics, the very dated roster, and the big one, this was at a point intended to be Street Fighter 2. Yeah, it plays like ass, its marking was completely disingenuous, and its mechanics unadulterated nonsense, but you can't help but look away. There's this captivating quality to it, like Neil Breen and Tommy Wiseau got together and decided to make a fighting game, while drunk. It's for these reasons, combined with its pre-Street Fighter 2 release date, why I honestly feel Human Killing Machine is very much not the worst fighting game I've ever played, but it's damn close. It then therefore sits right alongside the mighty Criticom at the top of the tier list. Oh yeah, and, and Brutal is there too, I, I guess, I, I forgot about it honestly. Oh wait, nobody said, what happened to tier techs? Well, they lingered on for a good few years, primarily developing poor licensed handheld adaptations for the Game Boy, Gear, and Color, but didn't last too long into the Game Boy Advance's life, as they mercifully shut their doors in 2003. A bit of a sad, farty end to the company, but one that's nevertheless appropriate. Ooh, thanks again to Dan for nominating this legendary failure. And if you'd like to do much of the same, you can head on over to the fighting temples of the Flophouse VIP Patreon and become a big boss to throw a contender in our ring to see if it can be crowned the worst fighting game.